Yay, are you ready? Hi, everybody. <laughs> so thank you for coming. This is actually our very first Women Who Code event for the Cincinnati chapter. So we're very excited. Um, and thank you all for taking the time to do the panel. We, I'm, I'm especially very excited to hear everybody's input. So um, I'll quickly start by uh, introducing you to everybody that's on the panel. And then I'll have them go around and do just a quick kind of introduction to yourself. Let us know um, a little bit about you, whatever you feel like uh, divulging. Uh, so uh, <laughs> to the right of me is Catherine Devlin. And she is an innovation specialist at 18F. And then we have Liz Naramore, or Elizabeth Naramore, okay, <laughs> who is the patchwork community manager at GitHub. And then Cindy Brown, who's a software engineer at NaviNet, Inc. And she's also a director on the, on, for WWC Cincy, Cincy WWC. <laughs> and Karen Meyer, who is a developer at Cognitech. Nice. <laughs> and then last but not least, Catherine Tornwall, who is a developer here at Gaslight, who was gracious enough to also sponsor and host this event. So Catherine's been doing a lot of work for that, so we're very grateful. <laughs> and um, I'm Tara Manisic. I'm a software engineer at Modulus, and uh, I will pass it over to you okay. <laughs> to introduce yourself. All right. So um, yeah, um, I came from Minnesota. I was I studied chemical engineering, tried to get a job. It turned into a C programming job. I left to study more chemical engineering, tried to get a job, and I couldn't. And so I went to the secretarial pool, and that turned into a database administration job. Um, and so I guess I stopped fighting it and realized that I actually like this stuff anyway. Um, <laughs> aside from the C, the C company was actually really dysfunctional, but um, it, so yeah, that was in, in 99 that I turned into a database administrator and then gradually added Python programming um, a few years later to that. And I wouldn't have actually called myself a web developer until about a year and a half ago, and I still wouldn't call myself a good one. But, um, you know, you, basically I've never been, my, my computer science education was a one month J term course, and um, so I have done a whole lot of faking it, but that's okay. Um, and yeah, I work for 18F, which I will babble about a lot at some point, probably because I absolutely love it. And I will pass the microphone. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Elizabeth. Um, I actually went to school for organizational behavior. That's what my degree is in. And, um, but we had computers all in our family. I was programming basic at like 10 years old because my brother did it and I thought it was cool. But then I, you know, you take it to school and then it turns out that wasn't so cool. Like nobody else did it. <laughs> so I decided you know, I don't want to do this nerdy computer thing. I would rather just learn about um, behavior and psychology because I think that side is really fascinating also. So um, then I uh, ended up here and there, jobs here and there. Um, I started teaching myself HTML in 97 because we, uh, the company I was working for needed a website and the, it was too expensive to pay someone who knew what they were doing. So I was like, well, this is my time. So I got to go over there and learn it. And then, uh, then I got in, really got into the PHP side of things because um, our website got over to but it just didn't die. Yeah, oh, I was yelling anyway. <laughs> Do you want to do this and keep talking? And I was just trying to like really interested. <laughs> so then. So then I got, um, I did PHP for like 10 years and I got really burned out on coding. Um, I didn't want to write another line of code, it turns out. Um, so I had always been very involved in the PHP community. I was one of the founders of PHP Women and uh, just very involved in the whole community. So I, I finally found a job where I could be a community manager. I thought that would be really cool. So I've been doing that for about five years. Um, I work now for GitHub for about the last three years. So I've kind of gone back to like the psychology and the behavioral and how we interact with each other and how we interact with technology. I find that stuff really fascinating. So that's kind of been my journey. It's winding and long, but that's all right. So it's a story. So here you go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I think it's interesting that none of us so far have had computer science degrees, <laughs> including me. Um, I lived in Boston and I graduated with a jazz composition degree from Berkeley and got involved in um, synthesis, and this was in the mid-80s. So synthesizers were, um, were like in their infancy, and that got me really interested in computers, basically. Um, 
And so I, I went from one job to the next to the next just learning um, on my own about first being a computer operator, because in those days they were all mainframes and you were an operator. Um, and had the fortune, the good fortune, to work with some startup companies up there and some really awesome MIT engineers took me under their wing and taught me. Uh, and so um, my whole career has been just like that, sort of self-taught, going from, from one to the next, so. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I can maybe make this actually into a faux mic. <laughs> yeah. We can like, that. oh yeah, yeah, yeah just, just hold it. So hello. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'll continue the trend of not having a computer <laughs> science degree. I actually, um, I went to the School for Creative and Performing Arts here in Cincinnati. Uh, studied ballet. I was actually, I guess, good enough to get paid for it professionally for a couple years until I figured that I was not good enough to get paid very much. <laughs> so I decided to move back home and um, go to college. Uh, so I studied physics and uh, graduated with a physics degree and then uh, realized there wasn't really any work for undergraduate physics. <laughs> so, but they were looking for computer programmers. Uh, so I just kind of fell into a computer programming job and uh, I really enjoyed it and uh, very similar. I've uh, been self-taught and uh, loving it and kind of going from job to job and learning more and here I am. <laughs> oh, I, James fixed the mic for us. <laughs> He's our baddie. Thank you, James. Thank you. Um, so I do have a computer science <laughs> I decided to go into computer science because I think it was that my brother was like really into programming games and stuff and I was like, that looks cool, I want to do that too, even though he's younger than me. <laughs> but So I got into it and took a couple classes I think in high school at Ohio University and just really fell in love with it because I was good at math, but I mean, what I, was, I didn't know what I was going to do with that at all. So. It turned into something I really love to do, and I just have so much fun playing with like back end, and I love doing the design on the front end, and I feel like you could be really creative with computers and programming. And it's just, wow, yeah, <laughs> I get excited. <laughs> As I think we all do. <laughs> Hence why we're here. <laughs> um, so if you all have any questions, let me know and I'll come over to you and you can ask. If you have any questions, let me know. We also have some questions we want to know. Uh, anybody yet? You can wait until you feel inspired. Oh, James? James is There's already inspired. The oh, there is? Yeah, James just has to talk loudly. Oh, just talk loudly, James. Okay. Uh, questions for Catherine, actually. <laughs> yes, James? <laughs> uh, so you said you came from a database administration background. What do you wish that developers about the database that they seem to not. <laughs> oh. No, I, I'm a nice DBA. Uh, <laughs> most database administrators are lawful evil. I'm kind of more chaotic good, so I'm not a very good database administrator in that sense. Uh, oh my gosh, I almost want to put, I, honestly, I've been a little bit shocked at um, most of the developers I've worked with know the database better than I expect them to. So I don't think I have a lot of complaints on that front. Now, there are always a lot of really powerful capabilities that the databases do have, especially if you're using something like Postgres, you should use Postgres. Um, <laughs> and, and a lot of the times developers just kind of like want to handle everything that they can at their level and just use the database as a, as a dumb, dumb big round. And there are some really, really interesting possibilities that, pro that are programmed into an advanced database. And so if you, if you can, you should have a conversation with your database people because um, they might be able to do some amazing things that you're killing yourself to do on the code side and it's already been implemented better anyway. Um, so have that conversation. Um, uh, yeah, that's about all I got to say. Don't be too scared. I know DBAs like sysadmins to, you know, to say no, but um, <laughs> don't be too scared. Or talk to me because I don't say resources you would suggest to developers to, to go into and learn more about 
You know, and that is actually a complaint about the database world, is it doesn't have quite this level of community. Uh, we don't have a viable Postgres group in Ohio, for example. Um, you know, so, so what's more awesome than the documentation? And the documentation is not all that, and that's the thing, the documentation is okay, but you always want to find that site that's even better than the docs, because it explains it so well. And I'm stumped for how you do that for database administration, so can I? I will grab the mic again if I think of a good, yeah, or I should do a, like a database office hour or something. Yeah, I was about to say, I think, I think all the database people should team up tonight and just start the revolution tonight, <laughs> personally. <laughs> Questions? Uh, so I actually have a question for the whole group because Catherine actually brought this up. Uh, when you were saying the imposter syndrome, like we always talk about that we feel this or you hear like fake it till you make it. And so I just want to know from all of you if you felt the imposter syndrome and how you've dealt with it. We can loop back to you if, you, if you're over talking. Everyone is faking it. Trust me. <laughs> 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 one great thing about getting involved in organizations is because it's a great opportunity to get w together with others and confirm that we're all faking. <laughs> so do that. <laughs> I, would, I would second that, absolutely. I, of course, I think everybody's felt it, but um, being self-taught, I think, for me personally, was really hard to get over because I would look at my colleagues and they all had degrees and I was just a hack. You know, I'd go to conferences and I would just be like, I don't even know what I'm doing, I'm out of my league, what in the hell, am I, what is happening? <laughs> and um, so that was really hard mentally to get over, but yeah, once you realize that everyone, no one knows what they're doing at all, and everyone is just completely faking, they might know one little piece of the puzzle, but they don't, they don't know as much as they would like, lead you to believe, so then it was like, oh, all right, well, maybe it's all right. That's fine. All right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's the best advice. Just, just believe that you, uh, you know what you know, and you have your creativity. Um, believe in yourself, and um, like she said, everybody's faking it, you know? Um, it's, uh, and just relax, and, and just do what you know to do, and if you have a question, just ask a question. It's, it's not a big deal, you know? And if you don't know something, a lot of people don't know things, and you know, you know other things, and, and it's all okay. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, no, that's great advice. To, um, just a, a little specific thing, so that helped me. Um, for example, I wanted to get a blog going, but like there's this big pressure, you know, to write your first blog post. You're like, what am I gonna say? The whole world's gonna say it. Never see it, you know. It's gotta be great. And and I I don't know. I finally got this that if you just put lots out there, then the pressure for each individual one goes down. <laughs> <laughs> they don't they don't all have to be good. They're great. You know, <laughs> just be like have some that are okay and then one that's really good and so if you just kind of get over that initial hump and just keep doing it then the pressure gets less uh, and also um, let me see what was the other oh uh, the same thing with, with speaking uh, so I was really nervous when I first started to speak uh, so it, it was actually good because I was terrified but it got me out of my comfort zone and then after I did it the first time I was like wow could do this. So, but it was that initial courage um, to do it. And also, just one more thing that I think that it's our, that at least I think, um, we're more as, as women apt to ask questions. And I think that's actually a superpower that, that I have. Because uh, I know a lot of people around me are hesitant, and I, I'm not. And I can learn a lot <laughs> by asking questions. So, that is a superpower. Yeah, when I started my first job right out of college, I had already been working there for six months uh, during the summers as an intern, but as soon as I was like an adult, I freaked out completely. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. I felt like I was thrown into this new world. I know I was working at the same place, <laughs> doing the same things. Like they, I, I could do it, but I didn't believe in myself when I started. And starting asking questions, even if it was just to validate that you're on the right path is really important to kind of help make you feel better. And recently, now that I've started going to like more meetups and stuff in the last year, like the people there are really awesome. And if you've got problems, like make sure you reach out and help or ask for help because 
everyone's super friendly here. I love Cincinnati for that reason. So yeah, you've, if, if you need support, it's pretty easy to reach out and find someone to help you, whether it's like on Cincy Tech Slack or something like that. Yeah, well, no, I just, and, and I will add that every time you ask a question, you're thinking, okay, the expert is going to think I'm dumb, the bystanders are going to think I'm dumb. In reality, the expert is thinking, good, she's paying attention. And the bystanders are thinking, oh, thank God somebody asked. <laughs> oh, that's a very good point. Well, the, that kind of leads me into another question of um, how, how do you, as like in technology or even like as a woman in technology or in a technical field, what do you find as good resources for you? Whether just being like tech in general or being finding a group like you? If anyone, if anyone knows. No. <laughs> so I think it just depends on um, finding a good community, whatever that means to you. So for me, when I was doing PHP, it was the PHP community, imagine. Um, but then it was also like the subgroup, which was the PHP women that I was really involved in. And it was kind of like, it's, it's really cool to be in a group that gets you on more than one level. Like I could tell them my stupid nerdy jokes and they would laugh and it was like, oh my God, someone thinks I'm funny. Because usually my family, <laughs> my family will just stare at me like really, like my kids and stay just like, you know, so like I was so happy that someone would like get me. It was great. So I think just having that, uh, just finding that community. And I, I, what I really have loved about the open source um, side of things, in, in particular, is the uh, how much that community has grown. And it's kind of splintered off. There's like little, you know, subgroups here and there. But there, there is no shortage of communities out there, whether it be Cincinnati or you know, global, like whatever. Like it's out there. You just have to look and find something that really speaks to you, that you feel like you belong and. Like, those are your people, you know, so, yeah. I like that. Um, as I was driving out here, I was thinking about, you know, some things and about my life. And um, coming up through the 80s, um, I have experienced a lot of, uh, you know, things were different then. And I experienced a lot of um, harassment and discrimination. I've always worked with... Uh, men have never worked with women um, and and I was thinking you know that some of the worst discriminatory situations actually led to some of the most valuable opportunities for me in the long run and so I think what got me through all that was I um, I thought I, I really really enjoyed what I was doing um, it in, it energized me, and it turned my mind on, and it gave me outlet for creativity. And those are the things that got me through all of that. Um, and like I said, led me to some really amazing opportunities in the long run. So, so it's, you know, it's like the Mountain Valley thing. Um, and so uh, things have gotten a lot better, uh, but things haven't gone away. But just, just holding on to what you're doing and why you're doing it, and the fact what it feeds you, and if it doesn't feed you, move on to something that does, so that you can, because there's that kind of stuff everywhere. Um, so that would just be. Yeah, no, I totally agree with every everything everyone has said. But in addition, I'd say just meeting like people in the community, especially women that you connect with, that um, is a wonderful thing too. I mean, I, I remember the first time I met like. Elizabeth and Maggie, I'm just like, where were you when I was like growing up? Because I totally wanted to hang with you. Um, but you know, <laughs> so it, it's nice um, connecting with other people that have similar loves. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Any other questions? Well, one thing that Cindy touched on that um, actually uh, we have a question about was assuming that it's been difficult for women in the tech field how do you think uh, things have changed for people in, in like women in the tech community now? I think it's gotten much better. <laughs> <laughs> Just so there's a, a lot more awareness about it and a lot more, I mean, groups like this um, getting together. I mean, I think when I first got started in it, um, you know, I, I persisted in it because I loved it, but it was a bit of the, um, the back of the bus uh, experience for me. I, to put this in context, you know, when I got on the school bus, and then there were the, the kids in the back of the bus, right? And you want to be in the back of the bus. 
<laughs> Has that never so, changed? So Is that one, consistent so forever? So one day you go and you sit in the back of the bus and you know they tease you and everything and you've got to decide are you going to stay in the back of the bus and deal with this or are you going to move somewhere else? And I stayed and finally they figured they couldn't get rid of me so they better, <laughs> they better just deal with me. So. That's a great analogy by the way. <laughs> like you, Karen. It's not that they tolerate you. I think you actually are pretty awesome. And I think they, they realize that you're just awesome, so they want you to stay. But now I don't even remember what the original question was. Uh, it was oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, to add to, to Karen's point about it being better, I think it definitely is better. Um, I just think there's a lot more resources available. So if you have a problem, you have um, people to talk to about that. There are you know things like code of conducts being um, implemented in conferences and open source projects and things like that. I think there's just a, a real awareness of the fact that, um, yeah, you can't just go up to a woman at a conference and try to like hit on her. Like that's not appropriate, right? And so, um, but for a long time, that was kind of like the thing because you were this, you know, unicorn. And so there was like, oh my God, marry me. You're a girl and you like programming, you know, like <laughs> ridiculousness. But you know, that was that was what was said at conferences. And I think that that though. The, Maybe it's still going on, but it feels like the instances, or at least the instances we hear about, are less and less. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's better. And I looked to my daughter, who's 15, and she wants nothing to do with programming at all. But, you know, if she changes <laughs> her mind, which would be awesome, I feel like the, the, the community and the atmosphere is going to be much better for her than it was, you know, for, for us. So, yay. Not that we're there by any means, but, you know, we're getting there. I have another question. Do you think the rise of remote communities has actually helped women do better in the tech world. Because they were able to basically, it was like meritocracy, they were able to show that they could do it and like basically let their work speak for them. You mean as opposed to um, this everything happening in Silicon Valley? Well, I mean like, so I think before, if, when, when you have like the, you're, you go into a company as a woman, everybody's mostly a man, you already have to deal with the fact that they might have opinions about you. But when you're remote, they don't have that interaction with you. You're just sending them the stuff. And so all it is is like, okay, can I show you, can I, can I provide the results for you? And if you can, then you're good. Yeah, so GitHub is, is based in San Francisco, of course, but we're mostly remote. We're 60-40 remote versus in San Francisco. And I find that's a really curious comment because um, <clears throat> yeah, I would say yes, it helps to a point, but there's also, um, not that everyone at GitHub does this, I think it's more of a San Francisco thing, actually, but there's a little bit of a geography bias, I think, that you're in the Midwest, so yeah, you might not really know how it is <laughs> in the big world. You know, I, I have heard shit stuff. <laughs> I'm like, really, really, you know, but I mean, at GitHub, I think it's better just because we are so spread out, we're all over the place, and like, that would be super uncool, but to like, go talk to people in San Francisco, I think there's like, actually a, a remote bias um, from them because they think they're all that, which they're not really, but whatever. Um, so uh, I think, I, I don't know the answer to your question if it helps or not. It, it kind of sets up another barrier, but I, I feel like others want to talk. Sure, um, I, I actually think this reminded me that we've noticed at 18F and discussed it a little bit that there's um, a danger in remoting in that um, you have to push harder sometimes to insert yourself into a conversation to be, socially present and if and if for gender reasons or whatever that doesn't go so much with your personality it's easier to disappear into the woodwork and so you maybe have to work harder to be visible and which is kind of ironic because um, in person you certainly can have trouble um, in, in person environments there's an authority issue where you you know you don't look very authoritative you look awfully female to me but um, <laughs> But on the other hand, when you're in a room of 50 middle-class, middle-aged white guys named Dave, at least people notice that you're there. Um, and online, that might not even happen. So. I've been a remote worker for 10 years. So I've, I've lived here in Cincinnati, and I work for a company in Boston. And um, it's definitely very challenging, like what you said. You, you, you have to learn to, be, because they're all in a conference room and you are this voice coming out of, a, out of this device in the middle of the room. And more often than not, they forget you're even there. And so, uh, and there's also, when you, when you do remote conferencing, there's a delay factor. So you're always talking over somebody because, because of the delay. And so, so you get perceived as, She's always interrupting everybody. <laughs> <laughs>
But then um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just, you know, choose your words well so that when you do speak, it rocks the room. And, you know, and then, then, then that's, you know, interrupting people is forgivable. <laughs> so would it, the rise of remote workers, obviously it's created a, a geographical bias and it's created logistical challenges, but in terms of the gender uh, problems, would you, like, so it's essentially like, it's so helping to solve one problem while working through other ones, but the ones that work through are more, more like, okay, how do we fix the solution versus how do we change the way people think? Yes, and, and you're right, and I think, it, and when you first asked the question, I thought, yes, it helps for the gender issue. Yeah. Um, if you can get over timidity, if you are that, you know, disposed that way, and I was. Um, and, if you, and if you have coworkers that are supportive. Um, I, I not only work with a group in Boston, but I work with a group in Belfast. So, you know, we're, we're very um, dispersed. And, and uh, it, when you first asked the question, I thought, yeah, because I become this disembodied voice, it, it often will come with more authority. And, um, and I found that to be interesting too, is that once, once, you get, once you are able to insert yourself and create that presence, um, then, and, and I don't do the video, and I think that's interesting. I refuse to do the video. And what's interesting is, because, is, is partly because of, and we're talking about gender issues, but partly because of age issues. Age issues and gender issues, I don't want them to enter into what's happening. And so I won't do the video. And I'll just, I'll just, I just I'm just this disembodied voice that carries authority. <laughs> <laughs> and it works. Yeah. Oh no, I'm just picking up tips. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, okay, uh, well, so I have, um, I have this, Two specific, I have a specific question after this, but I kind of want to ask a quick kind of broad question of each of you, and that's in your career, what has been the worst and best decision that you've made thus far? <laughs> the worst decision, that's hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know, I feel like I've made a really good decision coming down here and because it's helped me learn a lot and I've gotten more active in the community since I started thinking about coming to Gaslight, and that's probably actually really the best thing that's happened to me because I've gotten to meet so many other people um, and just make so many interesting relationships, and you learn so much more the more people you interact with, and I've found that to be just awesome. Um, I don't know what the worst decision was, though. I'm gonna have to skip on that. It <laughs> could be those burgers one. that you guys went out to lunch for that one time. That was a bad decision. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I'd list that under life. Yeah, <laughs> Burger Week was the worst decision of <laughs> my life. Right. Uh, so, so I was quickly thinking the worst, and it's hard to think of the worst, but I, I think um, a bad decisions that I made in my career were, was staying somewhere that I wasn't happy too long and just, you know, like, hoping it would change, and I just was unhappy, and, you know, I just should have packed up <laughs> and looked for greener fields sooner. Uh, the best decision, I think, was uh, finding the community. I mean, that has really just uh, made my life just wonderful, so I think that was the best decision. Um, probably the, again, I have trouble with the worst decision, too. Um, but the best decision is probably that, uh, the thing I love most about um, the jobs was the learning curve. And so then when, when the learning curve leveled off, I would change jobs. And I think that that's probably the best decision I made was to change jobs when I, when I wasn't challenged anymore. Um, because I worked with more people, I learned more technologies, um, I challenged myself every time you go on an interview, you know, you're challenging yourself to put yourself out there. And maybe the worst was, I think the worst was um, not, because I was a musician, I always thought I would be a musician and go back to a musician. I was doing computers on the side. And I think the worst decision was not to embrace it fully. I think that hurt me. 
So I think the worst decision was not being aware of the signs of burnout until it was too late, and then I didn't want to even look at code anymore. I think if I would have been more proactive and done a little better job at self-care and not trying to be all things to all people, because I had two small children at home, and I was working full-time and taking care of them full-time, so it was nuts. And I think in technology, it's, it's especially dangerous because it's such a fast-paced, moving, place that we're in. So you always feel like you're playing catch up. You always, there's always something new that you should be learning or that everybody else seems to know. And I don't know what this thing is. I better go learn it really quick, right? Like that made me a crazy person. I could, I could not keep up with everyone. And, and I think, so that was the second worst thing was trying to do that because you just cannot do it. You just can't know everything about everything. You just can't. So um, I think those were the two things. And I think the best, uh, the best decision I ever made which is a, a kind of funny because I just said it was my worst, but it was also my best is that realizing that um, code wasn't making me happy. It didn't care if it got written or not, but the community was where I found my passion and where I really liked connecting with people and seeing their passion and their, their excitement made, made me feel good and made like the fact that I could be in a job that would facilitate that and facilitate those interactions, like that, that was fulfilling to me and so, what, writing code was fine and I enjoyed it and I liked problem solving, but there was like a piece missing that wasn't super fulfilling. I didn't feel like I was changing lives or making anything really better, just making the company money, you know? So I was like, okay, but I still have the same paycheck or whatever. Um, so, so the best decision was switching to community, even though it meant like, you know, sacrificing like money and everything else. I don't have a fancy title or whatever, but, um, but it, was, it was good. It turned out to be the best decision for me, so. Thank you so much for giving me time to think. Um, <laughs> my worst decision, I think, was not from the code world. It was from that uh, chemical engineering graduate school. And I chose an advisor based on my excitement technically about the project, and I didn't pay attention to the personal dynamics. And that hasn't been the last time I made that decision. I tend to, you know, if I'm hypnotized by the technology, maybe I'm not going to pay enough attention to how the personal dynamics work. And they really, really, really matter. Um, and maybe I've learned that now. Um, best decision is when some folks were talking about doing a Python conference in Ohio. I said, yeah, we'll do it and I'll start it and I'm not going to worry about the fact that I don't really know enough or even have enough time to do it right. We're just going to do it, you know. Um, agile, you know, minimum viable conference. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's great. And then in, in iterations, it's been uh, getting better and better. Um, so I actually have a little bit of a specific question about um, being a parent and and uh, having like a kick-ass tech career. So like, have you known somebody, or if you're a parent, or just just how how viable that is, how successful that is, or have you seen it be successful, or felt it be successful? In a, I'm gonna pass. <laughs> So I, I guess it just depends on your definition of success. So if, if your definition of success is like a VP title or, or a CEO title or you know that corner office big paycheck thing, um, it will be a lot more challenging, I think, to have a family and to do all of those things without sacrificing something. So I feel very fortunate that I didn't have to do that. Um, I feel like my job has, I'm pretty successful at what I do. Um, you know, I don't have those fancy stuff, but whatever. I have two kids that I love very much, and they seem to love me. So um, it worked out great. Um, but yeah, it was extremely, extremely challenging. And I think if you don't have a support network, like I'm very fortunate that um, I have parents still around, and they still, like I have to travel next week. And so my, my ex-husband and I are divorced, so it's like week on, week off. It's my week with the kids, but he works, so it's kind of like, oh, what am I doing with the children? They're still old enough that they need supervision, unfortunately. Uh, they, would, they would argue with me, because they're 15 and 11, they'll be like, no, we're fine, mom, just leave, it's fine. But yeah, so, I, I, long story short, I still, you know, my parents are very involved and they're very supportive, and um, I don't think, I, well, I know I couldn't have done anything without them, so um, yeah, just having that support system really, really helps. So. Um, I'm not a parent, but uh, just, I know in the company that I work in now, there's a lot of support out there for parents, um, at least, in, this, in the company I'm in. And I think it's, it's happening out there too, you know, if, even with men, regardless of the gender, you know, they're, you can leave work early if you have to, you know, you can work from home, you can, so there's a lot more support out there, I think, than there ever was. Uh, 
yeah, kids, they turn your life upside down. But uh, I, I guess my, my thing would be is you can find your own balance with it, and that balance doesn't have to stay in one place. It can swing from this side to this side. Uh, when I had my son, I quit work entirely. I took dropped out of the industry for four and a half years. Um, and then after my youngest was about two and I felt comfortable, um, well, I was also having code shakes. <laughs> but <laughs> she, could, she could talk and I felt comfortable that, you know, my husband felt comfortable, you know, juice and could do the whole feeding thing. Then I went back to uh, work and I was able to jump back in there and, um, you know, it, it, isn't, it isn't a full stop thing. You can't, you can't do that and then come back and adjust, adjust your life. So those years when they took a lot of care, I didn't do a lot of side community stuff. I didn't code on the side and, and you know, write books or do anything like that. And, but that's, I had more time for that as I've gotten a little bit older. Uh, but still, I constantly, constantly have to rebalance. I mean, I come, you know, every few months, I'm just like, how am I doing with my work as opposed to my family life? And like this coming year, I was like, I'm not doing any more conference speaking. I'm not traveling next year. I'm, you know, feeling like I'm a little bit out of balance this way. So it's it's a constant, constant thing. I ask I ask those questions. So. <laughs> 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 yeah, but it's really cool to see yeah, hear what Karen has to say because I'm like, Karen's amazing. How does she fit all of these, these things in the day? Because you like wrote a book this year and did a bunch of conferences, so. Yeah, and I was like, wait, that's too much. <laughs> <laughs> and now I know, and I feel better. <laughs> it's that imposter syndrome thing. Like, why can't I be as good as her? <laughs> Any questions from the crowd? Um, I have uh, one last question um, that I, I would like some, an answer from each of you. I demand an answer from each of you. No. <laughs> um, so basically, I want to make sure I wear this right, but... Um, what do you feel will be the biggest challenge to the women coming into the industry behind you? And also, what do you think um, is a good strength for women to focus on to, to overcome those challenges? That's interesting. So when I started interviewing again, the biggest challenge for me was like trying to actually so basically, I had to act like I felt like I needed to act like one of the guys to be able to compete in that arena. As far as like I'm super timid, and well, I started to act that way. I've opened up a lot since I have been more active in the communities, but I was super timid. I didn't really want to talk myself up at all, and I'm like, how am I going to get a job like this? And I feel so introverted. I don't feel that confident. I'm gonna have to just fake it because I know I'm that good, but I don't want to say that out loud. And I feel like learning interviewing skills would be a really big help to people trying to enter the industry. Because I, I don't see a lot of the discrimination type stuff that I think happens a lot. I, I certainly haven't seen it here personally. I've heard stories from other people my age that do have that problem, like in Austin and, and around the country. but. Yeah, I think the interview is probably the hardest part to kind of break in right now because it's a pretty competitive market to get some of the job, like the really desirable jobs. Uh, yeah, I think uh, confidence is definitely uh, definitely a key point, and also uh, knowing your balance and being aware of what you like and you don't like. Um, I think that that comes with time. And the, the one thing that I, I've appreciated as I'm getting older is I'm getting more of that, you know, I, I don't give a damn sort of attitude <laughs> which, of, of what other people think, which is, is kind of awesome. So um, I think that's great. <laughs> yeah, I think that the up upcoming challenges are going to be less gender issues, like you said. They're going to be confidence. The, the things that always helped me when I went out for interviews was because I wanted to be a musician and I didn't necessarily care about this. I, I felt very confident in, in my abilities and I thought, if you don't give me this job, I'll get another job. And that confidence, um, I think, came across to them as, wow, she's really confident. 
and, and I was relaxed. So if you're in an interview, be relaxed, be confident, and, and uh, that, gets you, that gets you really far. Um, and I, I'm not really sure what the challenges are gonna be for you guys coming up now. I think, I think less gender issues and more interpersonal issues probably. Um, and, and that's gonna, you're gonna find that everywhere, just being able to get along with someone or, or work out differences uh, in the workplace. Um. So I would say uh, one thing that was also a lesson that I learned was um, choosing who you surround yourself with. So like there are pieces of the community that are extremely negative because we're all problem solvers. So we're always looking for problems to solve. So something always has to be wrong with things, right? Like so there are people, especially like on Twitter, of course, that's what Twitter's for, right? Like to just complain about everything. But um, it can be really um, demotivating and really affect you personally if you surround yourself with, um, it could, I guess this could be applicable to women or men. I don't know. but. Um, just be careful of who you surround yourself with. Uh, make sure that it's a supportive group that wants you to succeed and that will help you succeed and not sabotage your efforts, maybe unknowingly. Um, I think that was a lesson that I learned. I had some uh, female friends that weren't as supportive as I thought maybe they seemed like they were. And <laughs> so it was really an interesting kind of thing. And so um, just be, be wary of that and, and choose carefully, so. Um, I am frustrated that even though the demand in our field is really, really, really good, the demand for brand new, fresh people is still really short. Everybody says, oh, you know, we want a lot of experience, and that's going to be a challenge for everybody who enters, but one way to get around that is like, oh yeah, I was coding when I was a teenager, I did this game for fun, you know, I've been doing some open source dabbling through college, yada, yada, and I don't see nearly as many women doing that, um, because I think that you know, we, we're doing so much great stuff at the adult level, and that's fantastic. Um, there's still a whole lot of, like, micro pushes and pulls that happen to girls long before they're at this stage that are directing their interests elsewhere. And even if they decide when they're an adult that it's time to go into the field, um, they're at a disadvantage if it's the first time they've really started to code. And I don't want to say that, like, you can't get in, but um, at the same time, I'd like young girls to... Um, have every chance to start getting a toe in early. Um, I'm not sure how to solve that. Those, those micro pushes and pulls are brutal um, and hard to control, but, but I see them happening. That's a very good point. Uh, does anybody have any questions before we wrap this up? Um, if we could give a round of applause to our panel. We're very grateful to have you all here. <laughs> we appreciate it. Um, and just a reminder, uh, so women, Cincy Women Who Code events every month, uh, and we also do a Code Together where we all come together at a location and just work on whatever projects we're working on. So check out the Meetup page, and I have more links about these wonderful women on the Meetup page, so if you want to learn more about them. And uh, now let's uh, drink and be merry. <laughs> Thank you.